Where is financial and patrimonial advice going? Will it be more and more digital and robo-advisor based? What advantages will savers obtain from such a potential revolution? Will computers replace more and more managers and financial advisors in investment strategies? Our investigation is continuing. We have taken a flight from Italy to London, the city, to meet some of the leading figures at one of the most important fintech fairs, Finnovate. In the following interview, we meet Stéphane Dubois, Chief Executive Officer and Founder at Exignite, a leading Silicon Valley company of the financial market data cloud solution. Amongst its customers, there are more than a thousand financial institutions around the world, from Nasdaq to Borsa Italiana, as well as some very well-known robo-advisors like Wealthfront, Betterment, Personal Capital and many more. In this sector, amongst the many people I interviewed, if there is someone who has a clear market vision, it is surely this Frenchman who has made his fortune in the USA. Let's hear him. Here is the interview. Would you tell us your experience with robo-advisors, companies you know well, coming from California and being one of their financial data suppliers? Sure. Uh, so, our experience with robo-advisors is that very early on they started using us as a data provider and uh, so we saw them in their early stages as they were thinking and pivoting from one model to the next over several years until they found a model that worked pretty well uh, and they started growing reasonably quickly right Still, I, I think that uh, robo-advisors, and uh, I like to call them digital wealth managers, instead of robo-advisors, they don't like the word either. <laughs> um, and at first, there's multiple models. There's some that are fully automated and some that are less automated and still have an advisor in the model as well. Uh, uh, but I, 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 think, I, I think there's a fundamental uh, opportunity and risk in the industry mm -hmm. with what they're doing. I used to work at a company called Advent Software, and Advent provided uh, back office uh, portfolio accounting functionality to many investors. And I've always, what I learned is that advice was always a personal relationship. Mm -hmm. It's always been like that. It was always, you know, fees, not so important. Performance, you know, I can tolerate ups and downs. It's all about personal relationship. So that's like you're like looking at Back in 1999, when the internet came in, we were like, oh my god, it's going to disintermediate advice and whatnot. And nothing really happened. It still stayed, remained a relationship business. What the robo advisors are doing, I think, is potentially taking advantage of of, of uh, an evolution in the mentalities, right? Advice used to be either you were self-directed, or you traded mm -hmm. yourself, you know, yes. Schwab, or, you know, do yourself, or you had an advisor, mm -hmm. and it was a person. What they've done is they try to truly automate the process. So far, it's a very simple model. It's like answer a few questions, allocate among a bunch of you know ETFs, and and do that, but they are targeting community with millennials, especially in Wealthfront, especially. Yes. Do you consider the millennial generation, those born during the 80s and 90s, to be an all too unimportant target, considering that not only in Italy, but also in Europe, the money is in the hands of senior generations? Well, I mean, it's a question of time, mm -hmm. right? You, the millennials don't have that much money. Mm -hmm. The big question, uh, some do, and I've seen, I have stories of millennials with a lot of money mm -hmm. throwing a lot of money at robo-advisors, millions of dollars, mm -hmm. when in normal times they would have gone to Goldman Sachs or they would have gone to you, they've gone, gone, you know, they would have had an advisor for that much money. But no, they like the instant gratification. They like uh, the automation. Right, uh, and the question is: as they grow, as they get richer, as they get their parents' money, mm -hmm. will they continue? 
how, my, how many of them will continue using the robo-advisors versus going to a traditional advisor? So I think, I, I look at the, the, the advice industry as a big pie, right? And it used to be that, you know, 30, 40 years ago, there was only, you know, full service brokers, right? And then the Schwabs of the world came in and they took, discount brokers took a, a big slice of the pie. And then in the 90s, the internet brokers came in and took another chunk of the pie. And I think uh, digital wealth managers are coming in and they're gonna take advantage of it. And so the pie, the other pieces are still going to be there. There's still going to be full service brokers, full service advisors. There's still going to be Schwabs. There's still going to be you know TD Ameritrade's. But then there's going to be a new segment that could become pretty sizable over the next few years. Uh, what what those people have done, which I don't think the industry has ever really tried to do, is really truly try to automate the process. Because I think advice remains a fairly manually intensive process. And what they've done is like, you know what, we, we don't want to do anything manually. So they've taken everything from the initial you know, client coming on board, the funding of the process, the, the trading, and everything is fully automated. So it's, it's very scalable, very cheap. Many institutions, many advisors still have a manual process. Mm -hmm. uh, that is their advantage. Mm -hmm. And because if, if there is indeed a rush in that direction, they can scale like nobody has been able to do it before. Uh, and you know Andy Rackliff from, from Wealthfront, who I know quite well, yes. he'll tell you, you know, first they pivoted their model many times. At first it didn't start at all like this. It was completely different. And they had multiple models and none of that really, really worked until they settled on the model that they have. And even then, with that model, it was not until they fully automated every element of the process, including the funding of the account, mm -hmm. that things started taking off. Because those millennials, they give up a you know, if, you, if I can do this today, yeah. I'm moving on to something else. Do you think that robo-advisors are overestimated, seen as their quotations are very high? Extremely, I mean, it's very high, but uh, again, it's, there's a big market. There's a lot of assets which they don't have. So there's a, have a lot of room to grow, right? And if you think that they have come up with a fairly good formula that will allow them to capture in a good amount and a reasonable amount of time a good chunk of the market, those valuations, you know, make sense, right? Uh, I think it could get worse before it gets better. Mm -hmm. But I don't think it's going to crash and burn. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's going to go away. I, I do think that because of the generational replacement. Mm -hmm. See, in 1999, it was the same people. Mm -hmm. We didn't change our habits. Mm -hmm. But now yes. you're talking about a different set of people. Mm -hmm. It's our kids, and our kids, they don't want to talk to somebody. We have observed 20 leading figures in this field, such as Wealthfront and Betterment. All these companies seem to be very similar, from their graphic approach to their portfolio advice. Do you not think it's a problem the fact that they are all proposing the same solution with passive management and substantially without differentiating their offer? Do we not run the risk of not adding real value to clients by selling them all the same thing? And, uh, I think they've taken a very simple approach, mm -hmm. yet very scalable approach, mm -hmm. right? Now, you can look at the industry and think that, you know, a lot of people in the industry mm -hmm. are not doing anything different. Right? They're, they're, They'll, I'll sit down with you and I'll understand you and I'll come up with an investment strategy and I, you have your own secret sauce and you know you'll put that in a bunch of funds. I mean there's a lot of people all they do is put their clients money in mutual funds, right? So now it's ETFs, ETFs are automated and that's, that's the advantage, it's automated versus mutual funds are not as, as automated. Uh, so I think today it's pretty simple. But they're gonna start adding complexity. They're gonna, you know, they're gonna try to grab this, and they'll allow you to invest to have more diverse investment strategy. They're not gonna go quickly because they want it to be automated. So before they allow you to invest into other asset classes or globally, they're gonna make sure that it's gonna remain fully automated. And you know how difficult it is as an, as an advisor to start. Okay, I'll allow you to trade bonds and I'll get into options and stuff. It changes the, the, the complexity of your business. They're going to look at that. They have time. They have time to look at it. 
they can they can grow what they have now. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's back to that personal relationship. Um, I look at advice and investment. Everybody has different strategies for sure. Everybody has a secret sauce and an angle. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, it's the personal relationship that makes the difference. Right. And of course, if you suck, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, you lose your customers over time, yes. right? Yeah. Um, uh, but it, it's the per now what they are building is a different kind of relationship with those customers. Mm -hmm. That relationship is built around user experience, mm -hmm. right? It's not based on I know you and I trust you and you're going to take care of me and my kids. Mm -hmm. Is I love using your product. I like the fact that it's in my pocket and I can do those things. That's how they build that relationship. And will they be able to build, gather more assets, mm -hmm. get more complex? Yes, in their, shallow you know, wallet thing, yeah. increasingly. And, but they, they, they could get into global markets years from now, mm -hmm. you know, and, and still be able to, to grow over time. So I, that, that's how I look at it. I think uh, this, it, I don't think it's going to collapse. I think it's going to take a wedge. Mm -hmm. The question is how big is the wedge, the wedge, the wedge is going to be? Um, what do you think of Finnovate 2015? And presuming you have already taken part in other American editions, and considering what your company takes care of, what do you believe to be of most interest, and what will have a major innovative impact? Uh, what I'm seeing in yes, London here, well, fin uh, what we're seeing here is a little different mm -hmm. from what we're seeing in the US. Um, uh, it, it, here's a lot more banking, mm -hmm. F, um, currency transfers, mm -hmm. FX, they, um, uh, not as much of capital market investment. Mm -hmm. thing. If you look at the presentation over the last two days, there were very few that were around portfolio mm -hmm. management. That we didn't see any robo advisor present yes. anything. You know, they In were, last edition, I think. Yeah, they were more, right? Um, Versus, I think there's a much heavier tone of that in the U.S. because it's obviously a more developed investment market as well. I think, uh, you know, I'm French. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, not a lot of people invest in stocks in France. It's not as commonplace. Yes. I'm sure it, Italy is a little bit like that. Mm -hmm. Versus in the U.S., every employee, every millennial <laughs> in our company invests in stuff. You know, they all do it out of school, right? Uh, so it's just a different mindset. So yeah, but it's <laughs> So that's, that's the main difference that we mm. see. Um, uh, we certainly see some very interesting ideas around, around the area where London is strong, like, uh, like FX markets and, and, and traditional banking. Um, but yeah, that's what, mm -hmm. I, that's what I would comment there.